Welcome to Headlines. This is David Lichtenstein here in the Yeshiva Shalmaila with an hour of Halacha. This week we'll do Mohashkafa. Last week, we are very proud to say we reached a million downloads. That's uh, 60 million minutes of Limud HaTayra Shkafa. So we are very proud of the Harbat HaTayra. And we thank all of our listeners and the commentators, those who agree and those who disagree for helping create this wonderful yeshiva. This week there was a, a darkness in the world. We lost one of the great luminaries, a, a person of inc- a tzaddik, a humble stories about him. If you go on the line, there's just thousands of stories. One story in particular I found very <laughs> interesting. When he was a young man in Kail, he started saying a shir in a yeshiva, and they didn't have money to pay their Magid so they fell behind a few months. And then they caught up and somebody sent in a lot of money or they raised money successfully. They got a new business development person and they came to catch up and they offered to, they came to them and they said, we owe you the money. He says, no, I lived without it. We don't need it. Just pay me going forward. So they said, how did you survive on so little the last three months? So he said, here it was in, in Southern Eretz Yisrael. He says, this part of the year, eggplant is very cheap. So for three months, me and my wife, we we decided we will only eat eggplant. Now to somebody, by the way, I'm not a particular fan of Baba Ganush. I don't know how anybody would live for three months on eggplant, but it's amazing the simplicity, the tzitkis, the humbleness, the avas yisrael, and the happiness that he radiated. I like to say over a story that a fellow I know by the name of Stefanski told me this story. He said a uh, his family moved to Bnei Brak, and his father wanted uh, to drive. He came from America, and he wanted to drive a, a Lincoln Continental. And they lived in Bnei Brak, and his wife said, you know, a Lincoln Continental in Bnei Brak, it's a poor town, it's a humble... No. So what do you do when you have an argument? You go to Rav Steinman. So they went to Rav Steinman, and... So he said to the the wife, what do you want? So she said, you know, it's Bnei Brak. My wife wants to drive. So he said, so what's wrong with him driving a Lincoln Continental here in Bnei Brak? So she said, people will be jealous. They'll be kinna. He's driving such a fancy car. So Steinman looked at her and he turned to the husband and he said, let me ask you something. How many Mesechtas do you know by heart? So the guy looks at her Steinman and he says, Mesechtas by heart? I, I don't know any Mesechtas by heart. He says, okay. How many, uh, how many prakim do you know by heart? You know, tell me in the Masechta, do you know Stein, Do you know five prakim? So he said, No, I don't know any prakim. So he said, Okay, you don't know prakim. He looked a little. He said, How many blat gemara do you know by heart? So the guy looked at Rav Steinman and he said, I don't know any blat gemara. So Rav Steinman looks, turns around, looks at the wife. He says, Don't worry, nobody's going to be jealous of your husband. And there was his whole. If it wasn't spiritual, if it didn't have meaning, it didn't have any value to him. Somebody really, a great artist. So this week, we will have two individuals. We will have Reb Shleimer Gadisman, who's a Rav in the West Side. He's the editor of the well-known Torah journal Yeshurun. He was also the, the individual who arranged all his travels outside of America. He will tell us some his memories about Rav Steinman, and in particular, he will tell us something about Rav Steinman's attitude towards yeshivas that didn't, or schools that didn't take in children who they didn't think were good enough, or the families weren't good enough. Sfar, in this case, was a Sfardisha student who the, a yeshiva didn't want to. And you'll hear Rav Steinman's attitude. I mean, my personal feeling about a school that doesn't take a kid in, it's, it's a Gemara. We have a precedent to it. And especially when you have parents that say, I won't send my kids if that kid is in the school. They're not chashev enough. The father the works. He's a balabas. He has a blue shirt. He's not a ben tire. He's a, you know, where do we have an analogy to that? Is the story of Kamsa Bar Kamsa. We won't let him in. And what did it do? Harvey Shleim. In fact, one of our guests today, our next guest is David Hager, who's going to experience, talk about Rav Steinman and the Nachal Haredi, his attitudes. There was an article, we'll put it online, about how I think 15,000 boys went to the Nachal Haredi because he encouraged those who weren't learning in yeshivas and who were becoming Shababniks. Go to the Nachal Haredi, he's going to talk about that. And David Hager told me a story. He, says he was once by a simcha. He didn't say this online. He once told it to me, and he said somebody came, 
and they and they said, you know, you can't be here. Like you had once, you had an argument with him. So David Hager went over and he said, if he leaves, I leave. But we should have that attitude towards schools too. Well, listen to Rav Steinman. A, a Yerushalayim should say, you don't take that kid, you don't take that kid. I'm out of here. I don't want to be another bar- kamtza, bar kamtza. Create the hurt that who knows the the hurt that happens to these kids, the churban that they could do to to Klal Yisrael, an insulted person. We spoke about it other times. Then we will have a Rav, Rabbi Larry Rothwax. He's going to speak about his personal experience in giving an organ. He gave a kidney. An amazing Rav. This is a Rav. He was asked to speak on behalf of Reliefs. He said, you know, if, if I wasn't Margish it, if, if I didn't live it, how could I do it? And he went ahead, and before he gave the drush, he gave the organ donation, so he should be able to do it. Truly a, an incredible example of, of Yerush Shemayim. They say that there was a family, they brought their, they had an obese child, they brought him to a, a Rav, and they said, could you talk to my son about dieting? So he said, come back in a month. And they came back a month later, and the Rav said, you know, you should try to eat this, a little bit less sweets, a little less... So the parents asked Rav, why do you need a month? It's pretty simple what you said. He said, I had to go on a diet for a month before I could tell him to do it. And there's a lot of stuff we could talk about that. So Rabbi Rothwax is somebody who, a Rav, he had to speak about organ donation. He gave an organ first. These are some of our guests. Before we go to our guests, I would like to say a little thought on Hanukkah. You know, the Shulchan Aruch says that there's no suda on Hanukkah Mikar Adin, we said, Ramah says a little bit, and the Lavush says, Ramah, the Mishnah Bur brings it, he says, Purim was about, they wanted to kill us, so we celebrate by eating. The bodies were happy they survived. He says, Hanukkah it was a spiritual war, it was a cultural war. They wanted, they said, their culture is greater than our culture. He said, for that we don't eat, we, we light candles. We do something spiritual. We say Tyra, but it's not about food. It's about, it was a, this is the first cultural war Kuala Yisrael had. Now, why is Hanukkah so relevant today? I'll tell you why. Do you have a child or maybe yourself who's addicted to Facebook, to texting? Maybe he has a phone and he's texting. I was by a simcha recently. Everybody was running out women. They were Instagram posting pictures of the, the tables, Vine, Twitter, Internet addiction, addiction to the social culture of America is rampant. Visa Kristaltzach, Yudaltzach, Kal Yisrael, we're always at the forefront. We are at the forefront of technology too. And Hanukkah is supposed to be a zman of chinuch, of education, of how do we respond to cultural wars. So Hanukkah teaches us how to deal with your child or with yourself who's totally enthralled with the Internet, with Google News, with Vos is nice. Pick your favorite form of uh, electronic cocaine. How do we combat it? And so, no, their, your culture is not more beautiful than our culture. That's the war that's going on over here. So Chazal tell us, this is the only time in any Yom Tif, any mitzvah, there's a concept of hidr mitzvah, beautifying a mitzvah. It's always a hidr, it's an extra. Here, everybody does mahadrin mina mahadrin. We do the beauty of the beauty to the point that the Shulchan Aruch doesn't even bring the halacha that meikar adin, all you need is one candle. Which is interesting, because many nafkin mina is halacha. That, uh, for example, if you only have, if you have somebody, your friend doesn't have any, and you could do hither, do you give him your extra, do you do one, or you sign the chand ikar adin? So there are enough community, the Shulchan Aruch does not even bring, all it talks about is beautifying. So what is it? There's a, there's a deep message here. If we want to beat the Yavanim, and there's Yavanim in every generation, and certainly Western culture is, comes from Greek culture, right? Greeks were about beauty. They were about sports, beautiful bodies, hedonism, art, statues, etc. If we want to beat them, Chazala telling us, there's only one way your children will love Yiddishkeit more. And what is our beauty, the beauty of what we have, has to beat the beauty of what they have. I mean, there are those who will disagree. They'll say, no, we don't have to compete with them. We could build very, very high walls, you know, make huge ghettos. But I spoke to a Rashiv in Satmi. He said 20% of the kids, there's no culture that has more ghettos in Williamsburg. He said 20% of the kids there are off the derech. It sounded to me like a very high number. He was consistent. What does that mean? Walls will not win. Walls are good. We do have to have, we do have to create some barriers, but it's not enough. What we have has to be more beautiful than they have. So if we want to educate our children, and the leading word is, no, no, know this, know this, don't, 
we're going to lose. If Tzadiyas means like that video that came out, measuring, lining girls up like cattle and measuring their hairs and skirts, like the Gemara says, how they used to measure behemoths and erechen. If that's what your concept of Tzadiyas is to your daughters, you're going to lose your daughters. If Tzadiyas is about being the most noble, looking like the princess of England because you're a queen, because our beauty is greater than their beauty, then you can win with your children. We will not win by force. The Rani Shalom tell to you, Maisha, the door that's going into the mid, into Eretz Yisrael, the enlightened door, you will not win them by hitting the stone. You have to talk to the stone. Our beauty has to be greater than their beauty. And you know how that can be? You're saying, well, what's Lichtenstein, a balabas from Muncie, he's spouting dogma, it doesn't make any sense. How do we compete with Instagram? How do we compete with fancy cars and beautiful homes? And how do we compete with that? It's, it, that's so obvious. But the Torah tells us there are two types of beauty. There's the beauty of Yaifi. And it's, it's, not obje- it's not subjective, it's absolute. When somebody sees somebody who's just gorgeous, they recognize it. A car that's beautiful, a house that's beautiful, clothing, it's very easy, right? But there's another type of beauty that you see in the Torah very much, in particular in Hanukkah and in Yosef who comes out by Hanukkah, and it's the beauty of Chain. Hanukkah is Chain. Chain, Chate, right? Um, Yosef, Yosef Matzah Chain, Be'enei Kol Rayev. Yaisa's beauty was Chain. What's the difference of Chain and Yaifi? And the difference is, Yaifi is absolute. You can't deny it. Look, it's so beautiful. If you say it's not beautiful, Chain, on the other hand, is something you have to recognize. You have to be Maitza Chain. The first time somebody gave me some dry wine, I spit it out. I was used to, you know, the Kedem, cream, grape, concord with, you know, the sweet stuff. When you when you learn to appreciate what wine really is, right, you recognize, you, you, you spit out the sweet stuff, you can't drink it anymore. Chain, you have to be to chain. It's an exploration. So here's what psychologists have discovered. Current psychologists say that if you can spend a lot of money on an object, buy everybody beautiful jewelry for Yom Tif, or alternatively on an experience, we're going to go on a camping trip, he said, experiences, the joy of bonding, of real experiences, last much longer than objects. The glitz, the, the, the glitter, Hollywood, it's, 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 it catches the eye. It's like sugar. It's like giving a, a, a kid. But when we get older, if somebody says, you know, by, by dinner tonight, your wife says, we're having uh, candies for the first course, licorice for the second course, uh, popsicles for the third course, and candy corn. For, you, as an adult, you, you spit it out, right? Besides the fact you know you lose all your teeth. So there's ches, there's yoifi, that's the glitz, the gold, and then there's chain. What is chain? Chain is when we sit around the table. And I've had, we have all the time, Friday people, Friday night. And they sit and they shut off, for the first time in years, they shut off their Blackberry, their iPhone, their Samsung, their Telex, their Beeper. And they sit for two hours and we talk. And they talk about how their life is going and what they're struggling with and what they suffered with and how they overcame it and what sensitivities they have to others. And they walk out two hours later and they say, you know, we haven't had a meal like that in, in, in a decade, it could be. We haven't connected with our children this way in a decade. That's chain. That's not yaifi. Kalal Yisrael, think of it. Our family values, our, ch- our love for our parents, for our children, our derecheretz, our community. Who has a, a community that has bikachaylem? Do you know that the wait for a kidney in America is seven and a half years, and you go to renewal, it's three months? Right? The, the, the concept of derecheret, of a yomtif, of, of stopping time, being mekadish is man. This is all chain. If we sit around a table and we say, we will make our family life, our Yiddishkeit, chain, more beautiful, then we, we want to be from the Mahadrin. We realize the beauty of candle is such a delicate thing. It flickers. It's not, a, it's not like a big brass lamp. If we, but we recognize the lasting value of Chain. Chain will trump Yaifi. Hollywood marriages, everyone comes with an ETD, an estimated time of divorce. 
our marriages last. The Gemara says there are three things that have chain. One of them is chain ishal baila. It's discovering the beauty of the other person. Chain aretz al yeshver. Chain mekach. Chain is about discovering the inner beauty. Hanukkah is if we want to win the culture wars for ourselves, for me and for you, how many people are, are, are orthodox that are going through the motions? If we want to be for our children, the, the message of Hanukkah is be from the Mahadran. Find the chain, find how our beauty, deep, meaningful beauty, is more lasting than something glitzy and shallow. Let's go to our wonderful guests. Let's hear some of the beautiful messages about Rav Steinman, just a great luminary that has lost dark in the world this week. Let's go to our guest. We have on the phone with us Rav Shlomo Gadisman, who's the editor of the Well Torah Journal Yeshurun from New York City. Welcome, Rabbi Gadisman. Shalom Aleichem. So, Rav Gadisman, I understand that you were a makurev with Hagoyin Rabbi Leib Steinman, Zecher Tzadik Levracha. And as such, could you share with us some of your recollections about uh, the Goyen Zechariah Levracha? So, Rabbi David, let me do it in the following way. Um, first of all, uh, I was Zecher to be uh, me Shpulei Glima, which means the edge of his garment, um, of his Talmidim in the Gaila, um, I did have the ability to watch him at close quarters because I had the privilege of being associated with his travels all around the world over a 10-year period or 12-year period starting in the um, early 2000s. Steinman uh, lamented that his ability to be Marvitz Tarabar Rabim um, because of his advanced age had somewhat diminished, so he took upon himself a very arduous task at his age of traveling all around the world and being mechazik Torah and Yiddishkeit in all sorts of places ranging from large Torah centers to the most obscure places he had very few people. Um, and since I had the ability to be mitzvah from those trips and help organize it to a certain degree, I had a vantage point which was very uh, unique in the sense that you saw a person literally um, up to 20 hours a day. And as you know, David, the general call is in the Lahavdal Alfei of the closer at hand you see secular leaders, less respect you have for them. The opposite is true of Gdali Yisrael and Ma'a Yedr Steinman. So I'm going to give you a couple of bullet points, so to speak, of what I think made him unique and try to illustrate it with a couple of stories as per your request. So on the Maidais Abel, which will be coming out starting uh, today and for the next, uh, th- throughout the Shiva and the Shleshim, you'll see a phrase that Kalal Israel uses, which is, Mi'itain lanu t'murasai, who will possibly give us his replacement. That's a stock phrase lifted from Amara Chazal. I really believe in this case it is true. I don't think that in our lifetime we will be zeichet to see someone with the unique combination of Tchunat HaNefesh and Sitkis um, and the ability to really represent what is best about Tari Yiddishkeit and be a Manig um, as we saw in Rav Shneiman. Why is that? Now, of course, Kali Yisrael was blessed with numerous Tzadikim um, in each dire, and all of us, certainly yourself, have had the privilege of interacting with Many Chashav told me to come, and the world is a much smaller place than it used to be, um, and we've been able to watch these people close up. However, I don't think anyone had the unique combination of, let's take point number one. On his personal precious, everybody's seen pictures of his personal lifestyle, which I don't have to describe. But I can tell you how this precious was penetrated to the core of his existence, his entire Mahalich HaChaim was to be mevatel, any zich, any type of personal personal um, aspect to his life that did not relate directly to Havad Hashem and Kavad Shemayim. I remember um, when we would come into halls, uh, which um, in today's day and age, all sorts of Chayin Bnei Yisrael would create a great Kavad Atayra. That was one of his aims on these trips 
to create Kavod Torah. And of course, people would stand up and they would sing and there would be large, enthusiastic um, outpouring of of uh, Kavod and affection for him personally, um, and for obviously for what he represented. And this would literally bother him to the extent that it hurt him, as if someone would take a needle and stick it into somebody's flesh. It literally hurt him. And he had to fight against any possible shemets of Kavod coming into his system by what he understood was Kavod Taira. And therefore, he would constantly, under his breath, and those of us who were physically situated close would hear this over and over again, he would say to himself, Kavod is Chazer. Kavod is Treif. Kavod is impermissible. <clears throat> and he would drill into himself with iron determination, um, the ability to create a wall between what was going on on the outside, a few feet away from him, in a very loud and visible manner, um, which was intended to give covet, of course, covet for the Torah, and that's what Talmud HaChachamim represent. But he understood that if you don't fight against it, it could somehow penetrate to your psyche. Not likely at the age of 90 or 95, which is when he carried out his trips, but nevertheless, he set up a barrier and he fought against any possible penetration into his total purity and rankheit. I remember once we were in uh, Manchester, uh, Man- in uh, Gateshead, in England, and we had to fly into a regional airport. Almost every place that we were flew into, in big places, we were able to work deals with the authorities and avoid the the uh, inevitable uh, degrading process of standing in line under security lines. The system didn't work perfectly, and this place, it was a uh, Newcastle, small airport, no one got the email, and we arrived there and we had to go through the normal security system, which in- involved uh, decloaking. Rav um at the age of 90-plus, uh, was asked to take off his kapata. I've n- I had never seen him, you know, standing around without his kapata um, in, uh, outside, certainly outside of his, uh, his personal office. Um, and they made him take off his hat, and just to give a little bit of a uh, you know twist to the knife, uh, based on the old British anti-Semitism, they asked him to take off his yarmulke. He was not in the position. We all protested. We were about to make an international in- incident, but he said, "Was they let them do what they wish? After all, busyness, having myself shamed, is what I need. Is good. Any possible cover that I have gotten over the last few days when I walked into rooms with thousands of people." Will be. I'll have a kapara by the busyness of these of these um, um, uh, British security guards who are making me undress myself, uh, be Robin. And he viewed that as a good thing. A story circulated in the last 24 hours is how someone came to him and asked him from Chila for having participated in some putting up um, putting up uh, pashkvilim, as they say in Eretz Yisrael, uh, attacking him. And Damon said, where do you live? I said, live in Yerushalayim. He says, how lucky you are you live in Yerushalayim. Um, I thank you. And this younger man says, thank me? Why are you thanking me? He says, it was good for me. Because by doing this, first of all, you know, he repeated again that uh, Lee would say there was busyness, it would be good for me. But he says there weren't any. Because when you did that, people learned to like me even more. What did he mean by that? What he meant was that when people understood, this is what I think he meant, when people understood that he was Kule at L'shem Shemayim, um, any possible divergence of opinion would be ameliorated by the fact that people understood that he had no possible Shemet of personal in it. It wasn't his personal opinion. He represented what he thought, and his thinking was usually um, crystal clear, and always pristine, what he represented was what he thought the Rabbi Yisraelim wanted. And therefore, if you disagree with me, you just make me happier. As I said, he had the aura of not having any negias whatsoever, and that created the um, big uh, Kiddush Hashem. I'll give you an example of how um, people were inspired by uh, by his piety and his approach to life. Um, I was there once after the 
um, large financial crashes in uh, 2008, something that all of us remember well. And people would come in constantly to complain to him, um, particularly American, European, Gvirim, how they had lost all sorts of money. Somebody came in, and I remember this distinctly because the numbers uh, stick in my mind. He said he was worth $80 million before the crash, and now he's down to 40. So Stamer looked at him and smiled. Now, how would normally, how do you answer that? So there are two possible ways. One is you use, obviously, you know, you scream at the guy and say, no, what are you complaining about? You still have $40 million. The other way would be to say, oh, you never, he lost $40 million. What a terrible thing, and commiserate with him. Or Steinman looked at him, he says, tell me. Let's talk about what's important in life. Let's talk about tzedakah. Let's talk about what could have been. He spent 10 minutes speaking to this person, and b'taychad varim, he managed to make him understand that he was better off than he had been before. Uh, he was $40 million lighter. Doesn't matter, because that $40 million was a burden. The Rabbi Nishalayim did you a favor by leaving you $40 million, by upgrading your ruchnias. And at the end of 12 minutes, his personal piety um, was imprinted on this other person who lived in a totally different world, and he walked out of there smiling. Um, and he walked out of there understanding that everything that Rabbi Shalom did was for his benefit. He had an ability to penetrate down to the core of complicated issues. We were once in a, I'll leave the name of the city out, on our trips, where there was a huge complicated mechlekes about various meisus uh, of He had not been briefed about this beforehand. He walked in there, um, two senior Rabbanim came to him and uh, told him certain basics. He thought about it. He asked one or two penetrating questions, and he was able to get down to the core of the issue literally within 10 minutes. He offered his das tire and offered a solution. Both of the parties who had been warring for years walked out of there feeling that they had gotten what they wanted, and he was able to settle Machlechus, which had been raging for close to a decade, literally in 10 minutes. But that's not the Chiddush. The Chiddush was that he understood intuitively exactly what the core issues were. Um, and this, I would watch this over and over again. At the same time, he had a certain tamimus to him, which when there was something which wasn't important and wasn't negea, he was totally disinterested. I remember once we were flying from point A to point B. In order to accommodate the incredible frenetic schedule that we had, sometimes we were in six or seven different cities in one day, we needed a private plane. So we leased a private plane. We asked Scott and leased a private plane. Our statement had no idea that he was sitting on a private plane once we had a layover and we had to wait 45 minutes and he asked what the delay was and we told him there's a rule when you're flying um, the pilots can't fly for more than a certain amount of hours and we had been flown for 12 hours straight it was some sort of a FAA rule which mandated a delay so he looked at us and said what do you mean El Al doesn't have any more pilots meaning he thought he was flying around an El Al flight because when he came onto the plane air to Israel he came on an El Al flight um, and he had no idea that he was being transferred to a private plane and that he was being driven around um, in comparative luxury, because to him, luxury was zero. He had no idea what he was sitting on. To him, as soon as he went into his own little world, he was mufka until he came out of it, and then he was at the top of everybody's game. Um, he, uh, time and time again, he would indicate that his only interest in life was L'Shem Shemayim, but it would a particularly... I remember once we were flying over, we were flying to, to uh, Gibraltar. Gibraltar has a unique halacha characteristic to it because there is a machleks in the Paiskim without going to this at length as to what sort of brachas you make on the Yamagadal, whether the Yamagadal is Mediterranean or the Atlantic. Um, and since there's a machleks, which one it is, so there's only one place in the world where you can make this bracha with absolute surety that you are seeing both, and that is on top of Gibraltar where you can see the confluence of the Mediterranean and the Atlantic. This is a very exciting thing. How often do people get to do that? Um, you can see it on the top of the peak in Gibraltar, but of course you can also see it from a plane coming to land in Gibraltar. So when we left wherever we were coming from, um, on the way there, we all got busy with this bracha, once in a lifetime bracha, and as we were heading toward it, we copied the relevant brachas, so I approached Rosh Hashim and I told him, Rosh Hashim, we'll come to this place and we'll get a chance to make a brach. He was learning, as he always did. And he looked at me and he shrugged and he said, No, very nice. Which means, my mission in life is to learn and teach Torah. Very nice to make rare brachas, but that's exciting. That's shtick. 
that has Nagiyas attached to it because you want to be able to say that you made this bracha and you're a special person. I don't need that. All I want to do is what Rabbi Shalom tells me to do. And he tells me to learn Tyre whenever I can. Tell me Tyre can I get kulam. Ich zuchnish kan bracha is nadira. So I'm not looking for any um, rare brachas because he understood that this was to some degree for us and not necessarily l'chveid shamayim. So he had the ability... Oh, just say, Rabbi, yeah. Rabbi Gottesman, he was supposed to be quite outspoken about uh, um, the type of... Um, exclusive behavior that you know yeshivas have we accept this bacha we only take mitsuyanim you're not good enough for our school and there are some very famous videos did you ever discuss that topic with him yes we did a lot because it came up here in our travels in america because the same question that arose in eretz arose even to a greater degree because everything that happens in eretz gets redoubled here in america so the same um, problems i won't characterize it with adjectives that arose in eretz yisrael um, arose here. Everybody's seen that video in which uh, he told the people that who didn't want to accept a Svarish uh, um, student into the class because the family would degrade the level of the standing. And everybody knows what he said in Gaiva Gaiva. He said this in public. He said this at the Tarmasar convention. I had the privilege of asking him questions about that. And he was very vociferous about how all of this was, in fact, Gaiva, there was Nigias attached to it. You weren't looking out for, not of course you weren't looking out for the individual child who you wanted to keep out of the class. You were not even looking out for the other children. That's not what you were all about. What you, the Manal, is really looking at is to protect the covet of your school, but it's all a shame shemaim. He was a master at stripping away Nigias. And therefore, anyone who came to him with shame shemaim, he had a famous saying, I heard it and say it to myself, I heard it myself, he would say it only in close quarters. He said, when a person comes to me and says, he is, I'm working here, all the Shem Shemayim, I knew that the Shem Shemayim component was zero. Otherwise, you wouldn't have told me that. If a person came to me and said, give me a bracha, at least 20% of my actions should come to the Shem Shemayim, he said, no, then I gave him a bracha and maybe we can settle on 10%. But he felt that a lot of what passes for um, decisions in the entire world today were were uh, informed by Kavad and Gaiva and Nagias, and therefore he would instruct, he, if it was up to him, none of the stuff which goes on in all the schools today here in America would take place. Um, his mantra was that Chinuch and Taira belongs to Rabbi Shalom, not to anybody else. Um, and he would literally, he would he would lose his, his temper. And that was the only thing that I really lost the temper about because he was otherwise a total even keel. When he saw that people had Gaiva and Kavad and personal gears and chinuch decisions, um, he would he would uh, quote unquote as much as he could. He would go ballistic and he would let the person have it, as you saw on that tape. And this is repeated so, over and over so, again. So, Rabbi Gadisman, well, I, I had a principal who said, "It's not about gaiva; it's about protecting my franchise." Uh, in other words, if I take this kid in, people are going to say, "What? You took that kid in? Poor family, scholastically." Uh, and, and they won't want to send their kids. So he said, "I'm, I'm not. It's not about Gaiva." He said, "I'm, I'm protecting my franchise." Of exactly. My that was the key word. My franchise. Any sentence, and he said this over and over again. Any sentence which has zich in it, any sentence which has my or I in it, inherently means that it has personal negias, um and is puzzle. His, he was a person. This is the contrast that he had. And I'll give you one or two stories to back this up. He was a person who would brook no compromises when it came to Tyra. By definition, if you had no compromises, even counterintuitively, then you couldn't allow any personal my institution to inform the decision. I remember several times we were in um, Kirov-oriented cities. I remember once we were, this happened in Odessa, it happened in Argentina, um, and they wanted to, of course, organize um, seminars, organize a session with the Roshiva, with the um, care of people, um, and that included um, uh, men and women together. So they came to him and said, can we have men and women together? Um, can we have sessions of the Balchuvis, not the Rabbanim and the Rebbe, since they understood that everything was going to be um, whichever the Haredi standards of Frodo are, but, uh, the, you know, the, the Mekurav and the people are coming back to Yiddish guy, can we have mixed sessions? He said, absolutely not. So they looked at him and the Rebbe and said, what do you mean? How can we do this? Um, no one will come. We'll have these, these, I guarantee you, 
and I'll give you a test case. Um, we're going to have a session, or I will be there, and it'll be absolute hafrad, and they will all come. And exactly what he said happened, which means that his integrity and his lack of any personal chashboyness in them um, meant that he relied only on the Rabbi Shlelem. So he would tell the person running this school that you mentioned that I have to protect my franchise, that you're puzzled. It's not your franchise. It's the Rabbi Nesholeim's franchise. So now you're saying that you don't have enough betachan, that your school isn't going to prosper because you are taking in a child who you believe is not up to standards, and therefore my franchise will be degraded. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the Rabbi Nesholeim. And he would say this to people in every type of these questions. So how would he respond? How would he respond? All belong to the Rabbi Nesholeim. There is absolutely no quarter... No give given um, in mitzvahs. And, uh, you know, uh, go ahead, David. So how did he respond when when a prince, this is, you know, there are so many children, we see this all the time in so many schools. I mean, I, you, unfortunately, it's uh, where the principals really, really, you know, um, they sit there selecting and selecting and they, they make chakiris and bedikis if the parents did this to the parents, what type of shirts they wear, what type of shaitals they wear. What, so I'll how, tell you a famous it, line he had. He said a famous line. He said uh, he would tell us how in brisk um, the, 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 he, he went to the same cheder as the tailor's son. And not only that, he said the brisk Rav's children went to this cheder. But the tailor's son and the butcher's son, and of course, you know, in the old, in the, in the Haim, the tailors and butchers were Amaratsim. Um, he kind of was Maramas that they even were, quote unquote, moderna people. Um, this kind of a cheder would never work in our Haredi precincts this day, but it seemed to have worked for him reasonably well. His famous line was that in your standards, Avram Avinu would never have been able to get into cheder. <laughs> would they let Tarach yeah. son into cheder? That was his famous line. So he was vociferly against this, and his bottom line was, there's Nagias, there's Zich, Tara belongs to Rabbi Shalom. That's true of every single possible aspect. Kashrus, Shabbos, Kirov, it all belongs to Rabbi Shalom. Either you're in this L'Shem Shemaim, or you're not. Don't tell me that you have your own Cheshbainis involved in this. And therefore, his personal lack of Nagias made it difficult for people, because people would say, well, we're not in the same Madrig as you, Rosh Hashiva. And he would shrug, and he would say, we understand that, but either you're working for the Rabbi Shalom, you're not working for the Rabbi Shalom. Um, and he would sometimes infuriate people. But that is the standard to which he held to, and he held to literally the day that he was uh, nifter for the, his in, entire life. So he had a unique ability to weave through this contradiction of personal asceticism, personal tamimus, while at the same time being the most incredible pikeach Someone who could who could get to the core of Nakuda without any compromises, and make people walk away understanding it. Um, the people who I saw who were subjected to this um, to this uh, withering withering questions about their uh, negias or not walked away sh- shaking their heads, admitting that they understood it. And it happened to me too on various uh, various occasions. You know, um, I once when I founded uh, had the idea to found this terror journal because it wasn't a real Chash of a Terrell Journal in America. So I went to ask him, and I asked him, and he said, uh, no. I said, well, taking it back. You know, any other God will be so would have said, why not? Good thing. And he says, best to learn it. Sit and learn. So we finally explained to him that, you know, all, all sorts of cheshbonis, uh, and, you know, it took a while to get him to, to agree to it. This is a tiny example. Um, this goes all the way to the top, and the way, you know, the entire Haredi world is running Eretz Yisrael. He would not, any of the coatings and any of the layerings of covet and flattery and insincerity couldn't get by him. He had an incredible 100% foolproof radar detector for Emmis, and that's how he lived um, his entire life. And people came to respect it totally because they knew that he was 100% clean. And there'll never be anybody like who has that unique um, characteristic. As far as your question, was he in charge? And, you know, when schools and certain of our Haredi cities, I'll leave the name out, um, didn't want to take girls in. You know, this happened um, uh, over and over again. It still happens. Um, if they needed a directive, they went to Bnei Brak and they got a letter from Shtam, and all of a sudden all the girls ended up in schools, and Baruch Hashem, these schools are all thriving. So 
he understood it was as you said. It's my mysid, and, uh, and therefore I can't bring it down because I have to have the best mysid. He wasn't. Well, Rabbi Gottesman, thank you very much for sharing your recollections about Agoyin Rabbi Yisrael is a Chayinul Bracha, and thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. He's a Baruch. Well, let's move on to our next guest now. We have on the phone with us from Los Angeles, California, David Hager, who is one of the founders, chief supporters and custodians of Nachal Haredi, whose involvement has been since its beginning 18 years ago. Welcome, Reb David. Thank you. Before we start, David, I have to give a big confession. Yes. It's the first time that I'm speaking on the radio and all together in public, not because I'm such an honor, I'm just nervous. I have Amos at the Tzibua. So if I'm not ah. clear, don't hesitate to ask me again. Okay. So tell us a little bit about Nachal Haredi. Give us a snapshot of what Nachal Haredi is and what its mission is. Okay, we'll start. Uh, we started the project 18 years ago. A group of Rabonim came to the Misrada Bitachon, to the Defense Ministry, with a concept that will take to the army yeshiva boys that are not learning, just registered in the yeshiva, and the army will have to give the following thing. Number one, in the basis of the Nachal Haredi, uh, it should be glad kosher food, no women, and they will allow every day at least one hour to learn with our Rabonim. Uh, we will provide to the army a lot of services that they cannot provide because the boys have a lot of issues. Some of them cannot come home because the parents don't want them to be in the neighborhood. It will, it will hurt Shiduchim and so on. So this is how it starts. Uh, I have to tell you that we started with 30 boys, and it was almost mission impossible uh, to find these boys. Baruch Hashem, today, in Anachal Haredi, we call it really Netzach Yehuda, we have over 2,100 soldiers, and we have about 10,000 graduates. Now, the nice part that the army agree, and this is really, in my opinion, the most important thing, besides the other things that are also important, is the fact that instead of serving three years in the army, the first two years they are in a combat unit, the ones that qualified, and the third year, the army is providing them with education, whatever they missed in the yeshivas, because they don't have even high school degree, and this they do in the last 12 years, which opens them the opportunity to go to colleges, universities, or just to go to work. And the first few years, the Rabonim came out against us and everybody. Uh, I can tell you that few of the Rabonim that were involved in this project, including Rav Steyman, got a really terrible time. Rav Steyman, Zecher Tzadik Levrachaz, and we were Mevayashim in public. In Yeshiva Sponovich, he gave a shiur Kloli, and two idiots stood up and started screaming and embarrassing him. But Baruch Hashem, with all these obstacles, uh, the project is very successful. Most of the normal Rabonim quietly will approve this project. Naturally, nobody has a courage to say it, to say it in public. When you say nobody had the courage, Rav Steinman came out publicly, right? No, he didn't come public. Rav Steinman is a very smart man. Uh, he didn't come public. Uh, but when a, a father will come to him with a shyle, should I, so my son is not learning the, the yeshiva, should I send him to the Nachal Haredi? He will tell him, yes, he should be Matzliach. Publicly, he never said it. Uh, and even Arav Eliyoshi, what's interesting, whenever parents will come with the same shayle, uh, he will refer them to Arav Steyman. 
told him this is his knowledge is uh, in all the, all the issues there, and his psak is my psak. But did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear this from him yourself? No, I didn't hear it from him no. himself. I I was not lucky to meet him too much, too many times, and. Whenever I was meeting him, there were like 10 people around him, and I knew that he's trying to do it in a very quiet way. And, you, but I you, know... You're saying Rav Yashiv or Rav Steinman? Who are you referring to now? Uh, Rav Steinman. Rav Steinman. Rav Yashiv, uh, you know, if you will ask him about the project, he will refer you to Rav Steinman. And I can tell you, I'm very close to Rav Efrati, that was Ben Bait by Rav Yoshiv. He didn't have any opposition, but he didn't want to pass Shiles. And, uh, and did you did you ever have conversations with Rav Steinman about Nachal Haredi? No, I didn't have. Again, as I said, if I would be one-on-one, I would have. But I know that for a fact that he was very careful in public, and whenever I went to him, well, at least... Seven to ten, twelve people. But I can tell you that I had conversation with soldiers, and I tell you a very interesting uh, story. Uh, once I was in one of our bases, and I, you know, always when I go there, I like to schmooze with the boys or background who I did decide to go. And I see this yeshivish boy, and I start and ask him, "How did you get here?" So he told me, listen, I got an exemption. You know, when you are under the Torah Tom and auto exemption from serving the army, if you want to go overseas, the army will give you special permission. But usually it's limited to 30 or 40 days. And he got the permission for 30 days and he went to Europe. But, you know, he was never in a rush. He came back after 90 days. So automatically his exemption uh, was revoked and he, and he ended up being in, uh, in the Nachal Haredi, in Netzach Yehuda. However, he was planning in a few weeks when they get the guns to start shooting in there and go to the right doctor there and get an exemption. Uh, in Hebrew they are calling it Seif Secher. That is not normal. And then he told me the second week they had to do, they were walking like for 10, 15 uh, kilometers uh, and he got back to the base like 20 minutes before the nets. And his body, that was, by the way, Kippah Sruga, we have also like 20% of the boys are Kippot Sruga that are coming to us because they are very firm, and they want the glad kosher and no women in the base and so on. So this boy with the Kippah Sruga asked him if he can stay another 20 minutes so they will have a minion for the net. And this guy, Yaakov is his name, he told me, I net, before 9 o'clock in the shiva, I will not open my right eye. However, uh, this is how he told me, in Hebrew it sounds much better. He told me, but you know, we were schlepping together, uh, how do you call it, a stretcher for like 10 miles. How can I say to him no? And he said, the first time I went to the shul in the base, I turned on the air conditioning, I put my fingers to keep my eyes open, and I davened with, with the rest of the group and, and nets. The following Shabbos, when he came to Bnei Brak, he had some rub from his yeshiva that he was very close to him. And they decided that they would go to Rav Steinman with the Shaila. Now, this boy was a Talmud Chochem, so he had two Shailas to Rav Steinman. Number one, should he pretend that he's not now normal and he will be kicked out of the army? Number two, if to stay in the army, maybe he should uh, lower his profile so he would not be in a combat unit, because otherwise it's a sofek pikuach nefesh. So Rav Steyman ignored his first question and just answered him, the street is also pikuach nefesh. Wow. So, so you could see how special Rav Steyman was. 
even didn't bother to answer him about uh, should you go out of the army. He basically gave him support to be a chayal kravi, a combat uh, soldier. Funny enough, this so, boy became an officer and so on. So, and I had this feedback from a lot of Rabonim that went with parents to Rav Steinman. But unfortunately, people were attacking Rav Steinman. You know, you don't have any idea what the guy went through. I will urge all these people to go now to his cavern to ask Licho Mechile. Even what, he what was even. What did he go through? What? What did you <laughs> Oh my God, I will bring you a story that happened here in Los Angeles. And I was by him with a group of 20 people when it happened. I went to get a broche. Then they got a phone call. He was, I think it was 10 or 11 years ago in Los Angeles together with a girl, Rebbe. And from here they were supposed to go to New York and from New York to Toronto. They got a phone call that the streets of Borough Park, Borough Park in Williamsburg, is full with flyers against Arav Steyman because he supports the Nachal Haredi. And when he will get there, will be riots. So what they ended up doing, they told everybody that they canceled their trip to New York and they're going straight to Toronto. Meantime, the people that were planning the protest in New York took buses and they drove to Toronto. And in the end, he was landing in New York and he was in Borough Park. But you know that a tzaddik like him has to be bothered what to do, to go, not to go. So let me let me tell you, because I've, I've had on, you know, I get a lot of calls from a lot of these quote-unquote, the anti and let's let's go through some of the questions they say. They say that the boys have to listen to girls singing. Um, no, this is Narishkeit. This is Narishkeit. First of all, they are mixing between a regular army unit to the Netzach Yudah Nachal Haredi. In Nachal Haredi, a, a girl, forget singing, a girl in the bass, it's Baliroy or Balimotze. you much easier to find David in your house, the drop of Chometz, than to, to find a girl, forget uh, singing. I'll bring you a story. There was a, a lady by the name Orna. She was a, a major general head of manpower, which all the army units are under her. She's over 50, and let's put it this way, Sheker Achen applies on her, okay? And she came to visit the base. She didn't go inside the base. The officer came to a special uh, tent that they prepare outside the base. So a major general that is over 50, she didn't go inside the base. And she did it as respect. She understood this is the rule and regulation. My wife never went to the army bases because we don't want, even though you can say, you know, she goes with a shaitl and, you know, she covers everything and so on. But to the officer, he will not understand the difference. So therefore, right. it's black and white. No women. And to extreme way, by the way, you know, a lot of times when I'm meeting with the general and major general, and we have a lot of issue. Uh, they're saying, come on, uh, in Bnei Brak, there are no women. Uh, when you go to Kupat Cholim, uh, there is no nurses. For example, we had the issue in the beginning, but therefore we have our professional people that we are always solving the problem. Like So, David, what do you say? Every... Well, David, when people say, you know, you know, the Bachram go to uh, Nachal Haredi and they come out irreligious, they come out fry. How do, would you respond to that? <laughs> I will respond. Do me a favor and come for three hours to visit the boys in the base and let's talk then. It's it's nourish guide. I mean, for sure out of 2,000 soldiers that we have right now, if you were asking me in two, three years, will it be there two or five that will not be formed? Yes. For sure, but nothing to do with the army. Anyway, there will be none for me. Uh, the same way that we have now today in Yerushalayim, in Eretz Yisroel, every family has, uh, unfortunately, one boy that is off the derech, on the average. 
By us, it's exactly the opposite. The boys are getting chizuk for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, these boys could not sit and learn day and night. And while they were in yeshiva, they, they felt bad about themselves, they felt emptiness. Now, all of a sudden, they're doing something and they are successful in what they are doing. They feel good about themselves. Once they feel good about themselves, Yiddishkeit is also good. As one boy once told me, when he was in the yeshiva, how did he say it? He was sleeping because he has nothing better to do. Today he's sleeping because he's tired. So it's a small what, what difference, but say, major. But, 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 David, what about people who say, you know, you get a lot of the uh, the really, the Bachram who are, you get the worst Bachram and Shmira Shabbos is an issue there and the boys are on the internet and they're doing pornography and drugs. How do you respond to these people? Uh, I respond to these people in a very simple, short sentence. Come for three hours and see. Don't talk before you know what it is all about. Come to a base and see how the officers are doing seum on the Masechet with the soldiers. Come over to the base and see how a boy that doesn't come to davening is being kicked from the unit. It's the only army in the world that by Pukuda, by order, you have to be in shul three times a day. <laughs> And, wow. you know, what they accuse me, exactly the opposite. There is a journalist from the TV, his name is uh, Chaim Ben Avishai, or Avishai Ben Chaim. He's attacking me, and he said, listen, the army is making a ballet tshuva. Uh, they are coming out of the army much former than they went in. Is that, tr- is that true? Will, is that true? I would send post percentage they'll be getting a big chizuk. It's no question. Uh, it's no question that, uh, you know, we are the best yeshiva, the best yeshiva. Nobody can come compare to boys that at risk or potentially can be at risk. Our percentage is uh, is amazing. It's nothing to compare. As I told you, once a, four year, a boy feels good about himself, then there are no issue. The problem you is say, that, you know, ever. David, you say you have less boys at risk than many big yeshivas in the world. Oh, sure. We are doing the best job with these boys. This is, you know, as I told you, come with me for two, three hours, talk to the boys, and you will be, <laughs> you will be amazed. You have to understand that the officers in this unit are showing my Torah mitzvahs kalak b'chamura. You have officers that before they are starting a meeting with a lower level officer, they are learning a parak from Shmir Asaloshan. Uh, you go to the base and you see pictures of Arab El Yoshiv, Arab Ovadia, uh, Arab Steinman, everybody. You, you feel that you are in a yeshiva, but in a much stricter way. There is no such a thing not to do anything. So, David, what, so what would you good. say? David, what would you say to the people who? Um, who say that, you know, by Nachal Haredi existing, it's sort of opening the door for Yeshiva Bachrim to leave Yeshiva. It gives them like a Pesach, it gives them a Heter. It's a slippery slope, you know, the slippery slope argument in life. Well, how would you right. respond to those people? I respond to these people in the same way that I will respond to somebody on the Internet. Yes, if you want, you can go on the Internet and do terrible things. But I can tell you right now, I'm in the middle of the sugi of Ner uh, Hanukkah or Avdole, what's before? I'm learning it from Mr. Google, Rabbi Google. He gives me all the, whatever will take me 12 hours, I do it now in two hours. And I know it's much better. So, you know, to say, it's like to say, listen, uh, you should not teach uh, boys to read English. Because if you will know how to read English, you will read magazines that you are not allowed to. Uh, listen. Uh, but in reality, I can tell you one thing. Percentage-wise, 
it's amazing from a point of view of Yiddishkeit. I'm not talking about the point that it brings sholem between the non-religious and religious. Today, a good as it doesn't support us, but when it comes to this argument, they're saying, oh, look at the, the soldier of Nachl Haredi. Because last year they got a war from the chief of staff as a number one brigade. So, you know, uh, so it makes Kiru. The Israeli army is a shortage of combat soldiers, and it's unfortunately it's reality. So it's a win win scenario. David, what would you say to, we had on the gentleman from Satna, he said, because of technology, Israel does not need any more soldiers. And the whole purpose of the army is to sort of create a melting pot to bring the Fruma into the uh, Israeli society because there is no shortage of soldiers. They don't need soldiers anymore because of drones and technology. As somebody who's very close to many officers there and many generals, how would you respond? I would respond that I, I wish he's right. I wish he's right. It will save a lot of lives. But unfortunately, this is Narishkeit because how would you pull terrorists out of villages in the middle of the night with a drone? Or how would you kill uh, every terrorist? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I can tell you that the nice part with our boys that this unit, uh, the Netzach Yehuda, has a lot of mission. Again, they are number one if uh, with uh, engaging with activities with terrorists, and every night they are into Jenin or villages pulling out people. So this is Narishkeit. Uh, believe David, me, if you don't you need lose? soldiers, you know how much it costs. <laughs> David, have there been casualties in that Yehuda? Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we had uh, three casualties. One is uh, two from terror, and one from a mistake in a major exercise from a different unit as well. It was friendly fire. And I tell you, this is really the hardest part I can see in this project. Uh, when you're saying to yourself, is it because of you that this kid is not around? The Nechom is a Tayeb, then it will be another Jewish kid. And my husband, the Damir Samir Tfei. But this is a hard moment that you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, uh, it's only three soldiers. To the family, it's a disaster, but relatively, Hashem is watching us. Compared to the amount of missions they are doing a year, how and many is that? Have... How, ma- how many missions do they do? We a year? are talking hundreds, we are talking almost every night. David, the Rabbani Shalom should give you Kayach to continue in your holy Molacha and um, what can I tell you? It's Chazak uh, Fermat. By the way, let me conclude. We had like last week an event uh, in New York, which by the way, David, you got lucky. I forgot about you. <laughs> but we had an older lady that gave us a really significant amount of money. And she is a Holocaust survivor. And she was saying, like, when I was there in Bergen-Belsen, if somebody will tell me that we'll have Jewish soldiers, yeah. I will understand it as a completely Meshuganer. Yeah. And she said, even now, that sometimes she gets very depressed for the fact that the last time she saw her parents, she was the age of 12. The only thing that pulls her out from this depression is the fact that we have today a Jewish army and she knows that it will never happen again. And by the way, nothing better about all the people that are opposing this is Hanukkah, the Maccabim. What were they? Yeah. They were soldiers, yeah. Hashmonai, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very Baruch much. Hashem, Baruch Hashem. I want you to emphasize also Rav Ovadia was very supportive, very supportive about the project, but also I always, when I went to him, I have, uh, with him I talked about it, and the few times that I was there, I was there five or six times, always I had uh, either Minister Atias at that time, Eli Ishai, and he called it continue in Melechet Avodas HaKodesh. This was his language. Thank you very much. Afrei Lechachanekar, David. 
Okay, as a car, David. Be matzliach. Amen. We have on the phone with us Rabbi Larry Rothwachs, who's the Rav of Base Aaron in Teaneck, New Jersey. He's also uh, the director of Rabbinics at uh, Rabbi Yitzhak al Welcome, Rabbi Rothwachs. Good morning. Thank you so much. So, Rabbi Rothwachs, could you tell us about your experience with a kidney transplant? Can you tell us what inspired you and what the experience was like? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so very briefly, and feel free to follow up with any specific questions you have. About three years ago, uh, I was contacted by a member of the Greater Tina community, uh, whose brother was uh, in need of a kidney at the time. His brother was uh, in his late 30s, obviously a young man, uh, and he was uh, he was in a difficult place. And the family decided, uh, after turning to renewal that they were going to try to run a campaign within the community to raise awareness about the need for uh, people to consider kidney donation in general uh, with the hope and expectation that there would be someone who would come forward for their son and brother. So I was contacted uh, not as a prospective donor, but just uh, as one of the members of the community, uh, one of the rabbinim in the community to see if our shul would participate in a program. Uh, And I... I expressed uh, immediately my my, uh, my my eager interest in participating. Uh, there was a there was a weekend that was planned uh, about a month or two later, in which there were going to be representatives from Renewal who were going to come down and speak about kidney donation. Uh, there was uh, somebody who was going to come and give a shir between the about uh, the halachas pertaining to kidney donation, and uh, they had requested that I, as uh, one of the uh, host rabbis, would speak about uh, the topic on Shabbos morning. As, uh, as part of the uh, Shabbos morning drasha. So uh, obviously I, I, I accepted, uh, I said no problem. Uh, as we got a little closer and I just began to think about that more and more, I realized that uh, it was going to be a little bit of a challenge for me to talk about something that I would never do myself. I, I had assumed, uh, it was just a given in my mind, that kidney donation is something which is important, but not really something that I could do. I wouldn't do it. Uh, the risks to me, short-term, long-term, uh, personally, as a father, as a husband, uh, as, 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 a, as, a, as a rabbi of the community at the time, as a rabbi in yeshiva, it, it just wasn't wasn't appropriate for me. So I had to articulate in my mind how I was going to communicate uh, a message to try to broadcast to the community that this is something which is of importance, but uh, even though I wouldn't do it. Uh, so I, I started to really be my eye into this sugya more than I ever had before. I don't mean from a halachic perspective, I just tried to research uh, the, the Matthias, what, what, what is involved in live donor transplants, uh, what are the risks, short-term, long-term, um, you know, w- w- what sort of, uh, you know, what's involved and what sort of impact would it have on my daily living, my ability to continue to do uh, that which I am doing. And um, the bottom line is, you know, it was, it was a long uh, process, but at the end of the day, uh, I found that the uh, the questions uh, were not nearly as compelling as the answers. Uh, I, I, you know, I think that uh, my message at the time and continues to be that the decision to donate uh, a kidney is a deeply personal one. I never have and I never would uh, encourage anybody to, to do so. I think it's something that people have to um, own as individuals. Uh, at the same time, I, I think that it is important that everybody just understand what is and what's not involved. There are certain assumptions that we naturally make, uh, and we assume that this is something that is just fraught with risk and challenge. And it's for that reason why we sometimes come to the conclusion that people who donate kidneys are extraordinary heroes. I can't speak about any other kidney donors. I, I can only speak about myself. Uh, I'm not a hero. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I, if I really felt that I was taking any risks that, uh, that I shouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't have done so. I, you know, I'm a nice guy, but there's only so far that I'm willing to go uh, to help another. But the fact of the matter is that I, I really felt that based on, again, my, my own research and the way I, the conclusion that I came to, it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a safe uh, move for me to do. It was one that uh, offered me the opportunity to, to really assist somebody in a way that... Uh, that, that so how, was, how, painful, uh, how, how, how painful was it? What was the recovery process like? The, the recovery was, I mean, it's all relative. I happen to have a pretty high threshold for pain. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't compare it to, uh, obviously, childbirth. I've been told that it's uh, not as painful as childbirth. Uh, the surgery itself, 
you know, you, they put you to sleep. So you, you know, you don't, you don't feel anything during the surgery. And afterwards, for a few days, there was some, uh, you know, some abdominal pain, which could be uh, managed through uh, medication. If I remember correctly, they gave me a pulp, uh, bottle of prescription painkillers, and I don't think I took one of them. Uh, and within, I would say within four weeks, I was completely back to myself. I, I, I was, went back to school within a week. Within two weeks, I had pretty much resumed a full schedule, but I probably couldn't have, you know, bent over easily without uh, feeling some pain. Uh, but within within four weeks, uh, I have had, you know, a, a no recollection, and, and even day to day right now, other than the fact that from time to time people ask, I'm having a conversation like I am right now, uh, it, 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 it's not in any way whatsoever part of my daily experience. I, I don't I don't think about it. I wouldn't realize it. There are hardly any simonim. On, on my body, I would have to really have to look hard to look because uh, the surgery is done laparoscopically right now, and it's, it leaves you uh, with no scars, certainly externally. And you know, and, uh, Rabbi Ruffix, do you know whose life you saved? I do know. So the the way it worked out, uh, the hashkacha was that the individual, the individual whose brother was the one who had reached out to me, was was actually the one who ultimately received my kidney. So we went ahead with that weekend and we tried to encourage the tuna community in general to become more aware of the need in the community for kidney donors uh and you know several months later uh, there was a transplant in which uh, i was Baruch Hashem, able to donate a kidney to this uh, this individual uh but as a result of our story and other stories in the community there has been there has been uh, in a i won't say a relative surge it's, it's not enough at the moment of people who have come forward and have uh, joined this very uh, special club, a couple of people who are, you know, willing to, uh, to to do such a thing for another. And uh, it's needless to say in some ways for me that's actually more rewarding than my own uh, personal experience myself, just seeing the compounding effect and the way that there there are people out there with, you know, open minds and hearts, and they just need to, to stop and look. So Rabbi Ruffax, let me share an astounding statistic. You know, we, uh, we I'm often um, um, criticized, rightfully so, for pointing out, you know, issues that need to be worked on, spoken about alcohol, you know, so many different topics. And I think it's important to trumpet the power of the the, the community of Achenu Kolbeis Yisrael, and that is that in the America at large, the wait time for a kidney is, I believe, over seven years, according to Google. And and renewal says that they are able to p- provide a kidney usually within 90 days. And it's just a testament to really the the, the sense of uh, of ichud of, of of Knesset Yisrael, the sense of arvus that we feel for one another. And I'll share with you, you know, I, I, I read an article, it was in the Times a few days ago, how in Japan there is an issue where there are so many lonely older people that they live in these huge complexes, and the only way they know that people died is when a smell starts emanating from one of these people under the doors. And they break down, and it's said it's like a, a Makis Medina in Japan. And I just think about our communities where there's such a powerful sense of arvas that there's a 90-day wait list for a person to undergo an operation to give a brother or a sister a kidney. It's it's just a remarkable testament to Havas Yisrael. It's a remarkable testament to dedication, to achdas, to to uh, you know Havas Aboyre, Havas Yisrael. It's, it's truly astounding. It's an astounding Absolutely. statistic. Absolutely. I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Renewal also says often that an overwhelming uh, percentage of the altruistic donations in this country are facilitated through Renewal. So, you know, as you mentioned, the fact that, you know, somebody who has a family member who is able to come forward, you know, Baruch Hashem, often we find in our community that process is expedited. But even uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, in some respects, in, in the more... Uh, incredible situation where you have somebody who either doesn't have a family member who is available or who is fit to donate, and you have other members, complete strangers of the community, who are uh, eager uh, to participate in this extraordinary mitzvah. It is a tremendous uh, testament to call yourself to the works of this great organization. And uh, just several weeks ago, there was an event in uh, Teaneck, the Sukkot Sadaf, one of the Rabbanim who uh, received a uh, kidney, 
uh, and they brought together, I think if I remember correctly, 12 uh, kidney donors from uh, the uh, Teaneck Bergenfield community. And uh, I was personally very reluctant to even go to this event. I didn't, you know, really, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't appreciate the uh, the public fanfare around this. But I understood, and that's really the reason why I'm on with you right now. That it, it is, it is important that uh, we we promote this message, and it's important for people to know that there are others just like them, uh, individuals who are not risk takers. I, I don't ski. I don't jump out of planes. But there are very, very few things that I'm willing to do in this world that would risk my uh, my health. Uh, in fact, there are none. Uh, I, I live a, a very healthy lifestyle, and I take my health seriously, and I don't take it for granted. Um, and it's important for people to know that uh, that there are, you know, regular, um, healthy, sensible individuals who have taken the time and effort to research this and come to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do. And this event was incredible because there are so many. There were so many different segments of Kaiso that were represented at this uh, suit. There were hundreds of people there. Uh, members of the Hasidic community, the modern Orthodox community, everybody in between. Um, there was a donor and a recipient that met for the first time on stage, uh, clearly coming from different communities, different backgrounds, different hashkafa. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we share the same biology. And, uh, so did you, it, did, really you make a, a, did you make a L'Shem Yichud before the, se- the surgery, like L'Shem Yichud to do a mitzvah, like you would do... Uh, on, you know, Hanukkah, Matzis, did you say, he didn't even look at him as a woman, Nefesh, Achas, did you, I'm curious, did you do that? So, I, I, I'm, I, I'm not, I am not a L'Shem Yichud-minded uh, kind of person, uh, which, you know, which you could perhaps appreciate, but I, I, I can tell you that it was ex- I was exceedingly excited on the day of the transplant. I will still remember uh, davening, I couldn't get a menu because it was, I had to be there early in the morning, so davening in the uh, in the hospital it was an extraordinary moment, and I wanted so much to just be able to uh, to stay awake as long as I can. I I I had this awareness that there was something extraordinary that was about to happen, and uh, obviously it would only happen once in my life. Um, I understood uh, and continue to understand that you know that there are moments in life in which we are able to uh, fulfill you know mitzvot that uh, that are every mitzvah is obviously completely of infinite and immeasurable value. Uh, there are certain mitzvahs that just, you know, appear that way more apparently to our uh, limited mortal eyes. And uh, I, was, I was just very, very excited. And I, you know, met, even though I met him beforehand, met the recipient uh, shortly before the surgery. They were both prepped for surgery at the same time. I uh, gave him a hug. And, um, and I, I remember, you know, just saying to myself, I, I, would, I wish I could, I mean, I probably didn't want to stay up for it, but I, I wish I could be awake because, uh, you know, you don't want to sleep through something so extraordinary. Thank you very much for sharing us your experience, Rabbi Wachsbex. It's truly a, a shining example for our Sieber. Thank you. Also, thank you. Bye-bye. So, a frail of the Hanukkah to everybody. This is David Lichtenstein for Headlines Radio, Yeshiva Shomayla. And pass this link on to a friend of yours. We had had our millions download, share it with somebody else, the largest yeshiva in the world, Yeshiva Shalmaila, David Lichtenstein for Headlines Radio.